everyone. My name is Ashley Johnson and I'm a speech and feeding therapist here at Anna Shaw Children's Institute. Today I'm going to be talking with, to you about some mealtime challenges and some of the characteristics that define these challenges um, from a medical and motor perspective. And then later on, Amy Thomas, she's one of our occupational therapists and she'll be speaking with you regarding the sensory and behavioral components of mealtime challenges that um, your child may be experiencing. So let's get started. So who is at risk for a feeding disorder that could cause these mealtime challenges? Well, obviously children with nervous system disorders, which could include cerebral palsy, meningitis, encephalopathy, um, any kind of neurological situation. Um, <clears throat> children with specific medical conditions, such as Down syndrome, any kind of reflux. Obviously, if we have reflux, we don't want to eat, being that that's the result um, causing the reflux. Any sort of gastrointestinal motility disorders, cardiac disease, um, cleft lip and palate, food allergies, and of course, any condition affecting the airway, such as laryngomalacia. Um, poor oral motor skills. And I'll be getting into a little bit more length of in this later on, um, but basically that is difficulty with chewing and swallowing. Children that are born prematurely or with low birth weight, um, these children often have multiple sy systems that can be affected, affected and that puts them at increased risk of a feeding disorder. So it's important to remember when I'm giving this presentation that feeding is the one thing that we do that requires all of our systems to be working um, optimally. So for example would be if we have um, like a cold. When we have a cold, our appetites are decreased and we really don't feel like eating. So if you can imagine a child that may be struggling with any sort of heart issue, um, tummy problems, any other issue affecting their, their system, and then you ask them to eat, it's not going to end well. It's gonna, it's gonna result in a problem and be a significant barrier to adequate and appropriate eating. And then something that Amy will touch on a little bit more later is children with autism often also struggle with eating. Um, the numbers based on parent surveys indicate that feeding difficulties are 50 to 90% more prevalent in children with autism. Um, and typically, while they can have some underdeveloped oral motor um, mechanism due to their decreased food repertoire with foods that are more easy to eat um, versus um, more difficult to eat, it, it can result, like I said, in decreased oral, oral strength and coordination, but also their main thing is children with autism have trouble from a sensory and behavioral standpoint. And as I said, Amy, our occupational therapist, will be touching on that a little bit later. Okay, let's see here. So there's usually two components to a feeding disorder, the motor component and the sensory component. As I was just saying, and um, these can occur individually or they can be a problem as one. So I'm going to address the motor aspect. And as I said, Amy will address the sensory aspect later on. Postural control. Now it may seem like a pretty small thing, but it's pretty important. You're not just gonna throw your kid in a chair and say, here, eat. Um, Cause there could be a lot going on that could interfere from a postural standpoint resulting in them having a feeding problem. So postural control refers to a child's ability to maintain upright posture while seated without support. Um, often the rule is for best positioning of a child at a table for mealtime is the 90-90-90 rule. And trying to kind of picture what this looks like is children should be sitting with their hips, their knees, and their ankles all bent at 90 degrees. And um, I guess you could say that kind of looks like um, each, each of the joints, like a corner of a square, an angle like the corner of a square. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, you may be asking well, why is seating so important? And so how and where your child is sitting can have a huge impact on their success at meals. But it can affect, if your child's moving around a lot or struggling to sit up, it can affect them with their swallowing, it can affect their chewing, thus putting them at a greater risk of choking. And we definitely don't want that. Um, proper postural control allows, allows a child to sustain seated position without fatigue, but they can still move their arms and legs smoothly. 
And often if children are struggling with proper support, postural control, um, they may get so exhausted trying to sit up that they just don't want to finish a meal or may start skipping and just not wanting to eat because eating is a struggle for them um, in more ways than just just them having the feeding disorder, they're also struggling to sit up. So a lot of times parents will come into the clinic and say, well, I sit him down and he's wiggly and he's moving and he won't focus. And usually if you find yourself telling your child to sit up straight or don't lean on the table, they're, they're, having, they're having trouble with their posture. So you want to address that. Um, So another thing that you want to remember with postural control is that um, it's important to address that because the kids will sometimes adopt strategies that can be harmful while eating. Um, they'll adopt a technique called, or it's not really a technique, a position called W sitting. And that's when their legs are out to their sides behind them and that's not good for their hips. So you wanna address that. Um, so basically, in summary, without good postural control, a child might have poor oral motor coordination and poor coordination between breathing and swallowing, as I previously mentioned, placing them at risk for choking or aspiration. And this is just a summary of what I just said. Postural control involves pelvic stability, trunk control, resulting in good head control, jaw stability, and then lip mobility and tongue control. So it all leads into one thing. It's like a stair-step model. You want to make sure everything is, is good and stable to get your, your best feeding experience. And this shows um, two little babies, obviously enjoying their, their meal time. And you can see that um, babies and toddlers, their back should be straight with head and neck support. And their little feet should be flat on the surface with their knees and hips bent at a 90 degree angle, as I previously mentioned. And one thing that's important to remember is a lot of times um, you'll see high chairs without a, a foot support. And it's really important that your high chair have that and if at all possible that it be able to be adjusted because you want to support those little feet. It may be, you may think it's not a big deal for the feet to be supported and they can just dangle and kick them. Well, they can still kick them even if they have something there to support but it's really important that the, that foot support is there. Okay, I think we're going into oral motor challenges. So like I said, um, I'm going to discuss the motor aspect of a feeding problem. And oral motor issues um, usually mean in, inefficient, weak or uncoordinated oral motor skills that affect food management and safety. And often these oral motor skills develop within a system and it changes very quickly, both in structural growth and neurological development in those first few years of life. Because oral motor skills are a sequential progression of complex movement patterns, any kind of disruption can interfere with development of appropriate patterns resulting in um, lack of advancement or even loss of skill. So any reduction in mobility, agility, precision, and endurances can result in the gagging, coughing, vomiting, aspiration, and that could possibly be related to poor ability to adequately move the food in the mouth or chew the bolus, um, resulting in the food attempt, resulting in the child attempting to swallow the food minimally chewed, which can be leading to that choking and, and can be a scary situation. So you wanna make sure that your child is moving the food appropriately in their mouth and chewing it and not just mashing it or um, trying to swallow a bolus whole. And another thing that you wanna remember um, with children that don't chew very well or just learning that skill, um, portion size and amount that you present at once is very important especially with children with autism, they often wanna overstuff their mouth and that can become very, very dangerous. So you're in control of portion and amount, they're in control of what they eat. And Amy will touch on that a little bit more later. Um, another, another aspect of any kind of oral motor challenges is food refusal. And this can signify that a child is once again unable to control or form that bolus in their mouth, move and chew certain foods appropriately. And this could um, 
result in a child preferring a smooth texture versus a more crunchy texture. Because if you think about it, if you're eating yogurt or some kind of smooth texture, it doesn't really require much chewing. You just put it in your mouth. You do have to form a little bit of a bolus and then swallow it. You have to control it. Um, but if you eat something like a, a potato chip or a piece of chicken, that requires a whole lot more control, movement, chewing. And so children that have some issues with um, being able to move the food and formulate the food and chew the food appropriately usually prefer pureed consistencies. And, and sometimes it's just a sensory behavior or response, or response, but it's important to also address that oral motor um, aspect as well. So another issue that can result um, from any oral motor deficit is a lengthy meal time. So typically children, you want a meal to last approximately 20-ish minutes. Um, but if a child has any kind of oral motor deficit, this can increase the time of meals and result in fatigue and in inability to complete meals, which could eventually affect appropriate intake of nutrition for adequate growth and development. So you really wanna be aware of how long your child is taking to eat a meal. And as I previously mentioned, delay in texture advancement can also result from any kind of oral motor challenges. Um, children preferring smooth textures to textures of food that require more manipulating and chewing. So you wanna be aware of that. They can get stuck on certain textures and you don't want that to happen. You want them to continue to progress to a wide variety of age appropriate foods. So what exactly is going on in the mouth when a child has oral motor challenges? Um, usually, not well, not all the time, but a lot of the time you'll see decreased tone, um, meaning the strength is weaker in the mouth. So children with decreased tone, they often present with an open mouth posture. The tongue will rest beyond the lips. You'll see the tongue kind of hanging out past their lips, out of their mouth. Um, and so this frequently results in poor lip closure during chewing and swallowing. And therefore you'll see a lot of times food or um, liquids come out of their mouth. They'll have what we call anterior loss because they just don't have the strength to control and keep the food in their mouth. You will also see with spoon feeding, um, reduced strength with poor activation of top lip to remove food from a spoon. So if you think about it, when we go to pull food off of a spoon, we don't, we put it in our mouth, we don't scrape it off, we use that top lip to pull it off appropriately. But if you have low tone, you're going to either prefer the parent, they're going, the child is going to prefer the parent to scrape the food off in their mouth, um, into the child's mouth, or they will um, often lose the ability to figure out where to put their tongue, their lips, and they'll present with more of a groping mechanism. So there can also be a de decreased tone or strength in the tongue. And once a food is in the mouth, children with poor oral motor mechanism can present with a weakness in their tongue movement patterns. And you'll often see children um, suckle a bolus or kind of pump it with their tongue, a rolling motion instead of a nice movement to the side, to the teeth, and then presenting with a chew pattern. You'll see them suck on the bolus, mash it, roll it, and a lot of times if that doesn't work, they'll simply just spit the food out of their mouth. So as I was saying with the tongue, it's immature tongue movement patterns, a poor ability to move that tongue side to side, with reduced coordination and inefficient movement of the food. And also, children with any sort of weakness will, you will see that in the jaw stability as well, their jaw. They'll have a poor stability resulting in excessive movement when they chew, or sometimes you'll see their jaw shift side to side. Um, and instead of a nice, rotary chew pattern like you or I do as an adult, um, a more munch or up down chew pattern will be present versus that mature appropriate rotary chew. 
All right. So we have said all this. So what are some strategies to improve these oral motor skills? Um, and I really didn't mention much about drinking, but this is an important thing to remember um, if you have a child that presents with decreased oral motor strength and coordination, you want to, as much as you can, move forward with those, continue to progress those pattern, those appropriate patterns. So often children will get stuck on bottles or sippy cups if they have low oral motor tone or strength and coordination. And bottles and sippy cups promote those immature drinking patterns in older children. So if they, if your child is able to drink out of a regular cup or a straw cup, please do so. Also a 360 cup is good. Um, a lot of my parents prefer those. And if you're doing any spoon feeding, there's different spoons that have shallow bowls versus deep bowls. And children that are, are struggling to have that active lip movement that I talked about earlier, where they pull the food off the spoon, those shallow bowl spoons, toddler, or not toddler spoons, infant-like spoons are easier than the toddler munchkin brand, as I think it's what it's called. Um, the munchkin brand has a deeper bowl and the more infant-like spoons where the children are learning have a shallow bowl. So just be aware of that when you're looking at spoons to buy at the store. And also there's various oral motor tools that are often implemented to improve oral motor skills. And we do that a lot here in therapy. You have chewy tubes, any kind of disposable straws. Um, and the chewy tubes, various types of tubes can improve the strength and coordination of the oral musculature. Some of them require a um, stronger jaw strength to depress the chew versus a little bit of a weaker jaw um, strength. So I implement those as, as the child gets stronger with their skills. Um, and then I think I mentioned the disposable straws and then jewelry is something that my parents really like. And that's basically where kids will wear a necklace, a chewable necklace or um, a chewable bracelet around their wrist and they, they get to take the chewy wherever they go and where it is something fun too. So that's often um, something that's implemented as a strategy on the go, so to speak. So I think that concludes this portion of the presentation on mealtime challenges. Thank you for tuning in. Um, and if you have any concerns regarding your child's feeding or oral motor, or oral motor skills, please contact us here at the Anna Shaw Children's Institute. We'd be happy to work with you and your child. Um, and so Amy Thomas, our occupational therapist, will now be presenting on the sensory and behavioral challenges of mealtimes. Everybody have a great day. Hi, my name is Amy Thomas and I'm an occupational therapist at Anna Shaw Children's Institute. Ashley has covered some of the motor and mechanical issues we see in feeding disorders. So now we're going to look at some sensory and behavioral factors. First, we need to look at the difference between picky eaters and problem feeders. Our picky eaters are ones who have a decreased variety of less than 30 foods. When they lose foods due to burnout, they'll typically pick them back up after two weeks. Our picky eaters also will typically tolerate new foods on their plate, touch them, taste them, be more willing to interact with them. And they typically add um, new foods in 20 to 25 steps. They also have at least one fruit from each texture group um, on their preferred foods, which texture groups include crunchy, wet, sticky, mixed, soft, mashed, pureed. So in contrast, our problem feeders, they typically have a range of food of less than 20 foods. Um, foods lost due to burnout are typically not regained. A child falls apart when presented with new foods because they don't want any interaction with it. Um, kids can refuse entire categories of textures, um, such as just wanting crunchy carbohydrates as opposed to no wet, sticky textures and they typically require more than 25 steps to add foods. So feeding problems are common among children with autism. So what puts them at higher risk is that children with autism typically often experience difficulty with novel situations where expectations are unpredictable. This can lead to stress response due to limited flexibility and, and typically children with autism have strong mealtime associations. Um, heightened, uh, communicate, uh, heightened sensory processing concerns also um, place children with autism at higher risk. 
um, in which they have elevated responses to taste and smell, and they all can also have auditory filtering problems, which can affect the overall child's engagement with mealtime routines. Um, obviously, communication deficits can be um, put kids with autism at a higher risk. And then underlying medical issues such as reflux, food allergies, and constipation, which Ashley has already, um, has already addressed, that can also cause negative associations with eating. So an example um, of the different textures uh, of how kids um, can, can limit their diet is visual presentation. So uh, visual, to, for, for example, would be the sandwich must be on white Wonder Bread with Smucker's Grape Jelly, Skippy Creamy peanut, peanut Butter, not too much, a cut into four squares and no crust um, on a Thomas the Train plate, so, or the child will not eat it. Um, so that's more of an example of specificity, how the presentation can affect a child's willingness to um, try new foods or associations with mealtime. Another example on how kids' problem feeders can restrict their diet is based on texture. Obviously, this is kind of obvious with um, crunchy versus creamy. You think about the sensory feedback um, that you get from crunchy food as opposed to creamy food, it's completely different sensory experiences. So you can see how kids who are a little bit, have a heightened sense of uh, sensory processing can even have a little bit more challenges with accepting those non-preferred textures. Um, as, as oftentimes problem feeders show strong preferences for, for certain texture groups. So first we're gonna talk about um, general mealtime strategies on how to support healthy meal times and then move into more specific um, suggestions. So the first step we always try and have our families do is establish a regular meal and snack schedule to be followed every day to ensure your child will be hungry at meal times. Um, avoid snacks and sugary drinks, including milk before meal time. Um, any, any liquid that has sugar in it um, actually can um, suppresses hunger pains. So if you're hungry and you drink a sugary drink, including milk, because it does have a lot of sugar in it, um, that actually makes the child feel like they just ate an entire meal. The problem is sugary drinks are just carbohydrates. And so they burn off those that energy very quickly. So they're hungry um, sooner. So that's how we want to, to avoid the sugary drinks before meal time um, to allow the child to be um, hungry uh, to eat the actual food instead of drinking their calories. We also want to encourage self-feeding. Um, which is a messy process. Feeding is a multi-sensory activity involving your sense of sight, touch, smell, sound, and taste. So expect messes, and we want the kids to participate in mealtime and uh, interact uh, um, with it through all their senses, um, which helps, um, uh, which will help expand um, typically kids who are a little bit more rigid about what mealtime should look like. So a way to establish routine for meals and snacks is to tell your child that the meal will be ready in a few minutes. Let that way they know that the activity they're currently doing will be ending and, and also lets them know what's coming next. Turn TV and electronics off during meal time. TV and electronics on. If TV and electronics are on during meal time, it significantly decreases the child's engagement level in the eating process. Acts as a distractor, but then again, we talked about how the Feeding is a multi-sensory activity. And so if you're only focused on one thing from a visual system, it, it doesn't allow your other systems to engage in the process. Um, have food ready at the table before seating your child. This is an especially um, important for our younger kiddos or our kids who have a hard time waiting. Um, if, you're, if your child is, doesn't want to come to the table already and has to sit there and wait a few minutes on food, then, then, you're, then they will be upset even before um, having the opportunity to eat. Um, so best to have the food ready at the table before seating your child. Also, we want to set um, limits on the length of meal. 20 minutes is max time a child will need to finish a meal. Um, um, we'll talk a little bit more about guidelines on our next slide for kind of helping help and encourage that um, how child to stay at the table during the meal time process. Okay, so some more suggestions on how to support healthy meal times. Have your child eat at table, preferably sitting. Um, so to review what Ash already covered, why sitting is important. It, sitting um, sitting posture 
provides the appropriate postural control that leads to safer eating. So we know from a mechanical standpoint, if your child's seated and appropriately, then they're going to be a safer eater and less, less hazard, uh, less risk of choking and, and coughing and things on those lines. Um, also, sitting at the table provides your child an opportunity to be exposed to new foods from a sensory standpoint. If they always have the option to walk away from the table or to carry food away from the table, um, then the green beans or the mashed potatoes or whatever those new foods are that you're interested in your child trying are on the table, and their child doesn't really have to interact with it and doesn't even really have to acknowledge the new foods. Um, so it's good to identify why your child has difficulty sitting at the table. We want to look at some sensory issues. Um, we want to look at your child's emotional state leading up to the meal time. Um, if your child has been sitting uh, a lot of sedentary activities prior to meal time, another seated activity may be a little bit too much to ask at that point. Um, so it, it may be a good situation to make sure your child has some active time prior to asking them to sit down in a chair. Um, the opposite on the opposite end of that, kids who are really, really active and need a lot more sensory input, um, they may need a little bit of a calming activity prior to sitting down. Um, um, so you know your child best to know what, what, what is part of their daily sensory diet, to know um, what would help support their sitting in the middle time uh, at the dinner table to help support. We also want to look at the amount of sensory stimulation in the middle time environment. You want to look for patterns with when sitting at the table is less stressful for your child. Um, again, your child's expert, so, so know, you know best if they will do better with a very busy, very stimulating mealtime environment when the whole family is present, or if they do better sitting when in more quiet, calm time with fewer people. Again, we want to play to uh, set your child up for success. So if you feel that the quiet, quiet environment is a better place to start, to support those mealtime in-seat behaviors, then choose that and, and vice versa. If your child it likes a lot more excitement, a lot more stimulating than the dinner time when the whole family's there would be a better place to start. So from, uh, from a behavioral standpoint, eating may not be a very rewarding activity in and of itself. Um, some kids just aren't real motivated for food or it's not motivating enough to sit down. So we wanna take that into consideration. And also um, possibly use it uh, from a behavioral standpoint of um, say a special activity for after meal time. There's a preferred activity so that however, you'll, uh, whatever you told your child how they sit for one minute or two minutes or whatever it is, then they'll get that reinforcer after meal time. Because again, we want to reinforce every small step that our kiddos make when moving towards that target of sitting at the table with meal time. We can use timers to show more concretely that sitting is expected at meal time and gradually lengthen the time to build up success. Um, initially, uh, an initial step might just be to keep the food at the table if the child is used to walking around carrying food while eating, often which is called a grazing behavior. Oftentimes kids do prefer to move around because most kids don't like to sit, especially our younger kids. Um, so that might be a first initial step. And then from there, um, meet your child where they're at. If, if sometimes they sit for one or two minutes, then we're not going to expect them to sit for 20 minutes, which is which is the max amount of time we would we want a child to sit for meal time. We're going to set our timer for one or two minutes, and then we're going to be consistent with that over several meal times. And as we praise and reward that two minutes, and then they get down, we can gradually lengthen that to three minutes and, and four minutes and so on. Again, we want to do small manageable steps so that it's not an overwhelming process um, for our kiddos. Um, we touched a little bit on grazing, kids like to walk around eating food. The challenges with grazing are, are, are of course, we highlighted the, that they have the option to walk away from the new foods. They can just select their preferred foods and, and then take them throughout the house and eat them. So just from a sensory standpoint, they don't have as much opportunity to interact with, um, to even engage and acknowledge the new foods that you're wanting them to um, to add to what they're willing to eat. Some other challenges with grazing is typically kids just eat just enough to get rid of the hunger pains. Um, and so if you could just a small amount of, a, of of food at once, then you never actually get the opportunity to have that full gastric expansion where you get a full stomach and then it makes your stomach bigger where it can hold more food the next time you eat. Um, and so then you're kind of stuck in a cycle. If you eat just enough to get rid of the hunger pains, your stomach can't hold as much content. 
then you're hungry again in, in an hour instead of the two to three hours that we typically expect our preschoolers to be able to go without eating. Um, so it's just kind of a cycle to, to dip, the grazing does, it does not support weight gain. Um, some of our kids who have difficult time with, with gaining weight, oftentimes that's the first step we'll do is to kind of cut out the grazing, get them to the table at meal time, um, and cut out the in-between snacks so that we can, again, your child would move more hungry and prepare when the next meal time comes around. Okay, so we're gonna discuss in this section how to increase our food variety. Um, we want, the first step we want to do as parents is be willing to put consistent boundaries in place for your child, which may include um, which may include limiting access to snacky foods and drinks throughout the day. Um, uh, avoid child shopping at the cabinets. Um, where we've all, as a parent, been faced with this. With so if, if your child isn't able to adequately communicate what they're wanting, but the options you present aren't aren't doing it for them, um, then you go to the pantry and they leave, and then you're pulling out box after box after box. Um, but still not able to find um, exactly what the child is wanting to eat. Um, so one, one way that we can kind of help move past that, that habit is to either pull down two varieties that, of foods that you know your child will eat. We're not gonna pull down asparagus and, and green beans if that's something that your child never eats, but pull down two foods that, that are typically something your child eats and offer the choice between those. And we also we can use a designated snack basket or as an alternative because it has the number of snacks in the child in, in the basket throughout that the child will access throughout the day. Um, and so that it's very concrete that when all of those snacks are gone, then the snacking is finished for the day. Um, another way that we need to put some boundaries in place for our kid to help increase the variety is the limit the quantity of preferred foods at set meal time. Um, this is important because if if your child eats rolls and macaroni and cheese, but then sometimes eats chicken nuggets. Um, if they have unlimited access to the rolls and mac and cheese during meal time, then those chicken nuggets aren't going to be as appealing. Um, so again, have, establish that routine of one roll or two rolls, whatever you typically are doing, I would, I would stick with that and then gradually decrease that over time. So that again, if, if your child's eating the preferred foods and they're still hungry, then that sometimes food that they eat the chicken nuggets every so often, that might be a little bit more appealing. Again, turning off the TV and electronics during meal time will help with this as well. Um, and then having a child, having the child eat at the table. Um, when we start to think about um, increasing food variety, we think about food preferences in, in three categories, I'll always, sometimes, and never. Our always category is any food or sugary drink that, that's your go-to, your child consistently 90% of the time when you present them with that food or drink that they will eat. Um, our sometimes food is the foods that sometimes your child has eaten, sometimes they don't, um, or they may eat it if a preferred or always food isn't available. And the sometimes category always it also consists of those foods um, that your child ate previously, but typically that's kind of fallen off their list at this point. Our never foods is pretty much the, the foods that you presented to your child and they've never put in their mouth. Um, so that's important to kind of understand that for our next slide. Um, this, is, um, this is kind of our feeding hierarchy to, to the sensory steps to eating. Um, this is based on an approach by Kay Toomey that's a sensory feeding uh, approach. And it kind of highlights how we all add new food to our repertoires. So these are the foundational steps that we all follow when presented with new foods. First, we have to tolerate the food in front of us. Um, then we have to interact with it touch it either with our fork or our utensil or, and moving on to touching it with our fingers. We need to smell it um, and then taste it and then eventually lean to eating. So if we think back to our picky eaters versus problem feeders, our picky eaters, it takes them 20, 20 exposures to food to um, work through these steps before they're gonna eat it and add that to their food repertoire. So our problem feeders, we know that it takes much more than 20 steps. So this is a very lengthy process, um, but a good way to understand it from uh, a sensory standpoint that, that um, and help coach us on how to encourage interactions with our kids as opposed to just saying just try a bite or just one piece um, because there's different steps we can do 
to um, encourage interaction and then praise those steps for carryover. Okay, so again, moving on to, or in addition to how to increase variety of food is that we want to encourage daily interaction with new foods. Um, again, it's, a child is not gonna put a green bean in their mouth if they only see it once a month. So if that's something that's part of your regular mealtime as a family, green beans or broccoli or whatever it is, put that, have your child have the opportunity to, um, to inter interact with that new foods on a daily basis. And again, interact consists of first tolerating it in front of them, touching, smelling, looking, taste, et cetera. Um, we want to model positive food interactions. Um, and we also want all of our interactions to be child-directed. We never want to force food into our kids' mouths. We also don't want to force their hands into the food because I'll, um, if they have something in their mouth or on their hands that they do not like, that's going to set up a negative a mealtime association. And our problem feeders are already working from a negative standpoint when it comes to mealtime. So it's super important for all of our um, interactions with mealtime to be child-directed. We want to avoid phrases such as just eat one or just try a bite, as this may hinder the child's willingness to interact with the food. Um, instead, you can tell your child a different mode of action they would do to the food. Touch, poke, squish, crunch, smell, lick, kiss, kiss the food. The kids are much better with different options um, that does not involve them putting it in their mouth. And then we also want to praise that interaction. If your child's never touched the green bean and they squish it or they pick it up, then we're gonna praise that. Good job touching the green bean. And then talk about the texture of the green bean and, and that way move on to um, the next step of kind of describing things online. So it's squishy or it's sticky and make it a positive interactive experience. Divided plates may be beneficial so that new food doesn't contaminate the other foods on the plate. Uh, oftentimes kids whose visual system is a, is a very heightened, heightened awareness of, um, uh, of what is on the plate is something, if, if the chicken nuggets are, sit, are beside the macaroni and cheese and beside the green beans, that may all look like one new food to your child. So a divided plate, um, provides those concrete physical boundaries um, so that the child can see, okay, that's, that's a portion of the green beans, that's a portion of the chicken nuggets, and that's a portion of the macaroni and cheese. Um, through our interactions, encouraging our kids to have interactions with the unwanted food, we want to show them where they can put food that they do not want. Oftentimes, kids first response is to push the food away. Um, and, and oftentimes they do that because um, they're not wanting responsibility for that food. If it's in front of them, then they're, the, then they're afraid they're gonna be expected to put that in their mouth. And so we want to show them where they can put the unwanted food. Um, they can either put it beside their plate, they can hand it to you. We also use like what's called an all done bowl or a bye-bye bowl, which is just an empty bowl placed beside their plate so that they can pick the food up and put it in there if they want it. Um, and we, we view a child's willingness to put food in, into a different container or, or the bye-bye um, bowl, that's a huge step um, because if you think about what from a sensory standpoint, the child is using their fingers to pick it up so that smell is gonna get on their fingers. Um, they're touching it um, and it's also, they're looking at the food. Um, if they squish it or if they crunch, if it's something that's crunchy, it, they can interact with it from an auditory standpoint. So it's a, it is a, um, a step that we would definitely want to praise um, because it accomplishes two things. If the child doesn't want the food, uh, it shows them where you can put it instead of them throwing it on the floor. And also it encourages interactions, which is what we're wanting to do from a sensory standpoint. We also want to continue to offer foods um, that your child has previously refused. Um, you can also, um, for kids who have mealtime refusals, Instead of offering a preferred food as backup, then I would offer a choice between two sometimes foods. Again, our sometimes food from a few slides ago, those are the foods that your child eats on occasion or eats when preferred foods aren't available. Um, so if you feel like your child's had enough to eat, but they're asking for more, um, or they've refused to eat some of the food that you have asked them to do, instead of giving them a preferred food or a, mode or a reward food, um, I would offer them something off of their sometimes food. That way you, you don't see a, a pattern of mealtime refusals because the child's waiting to get the special treat or the preferred food at the end. 
Another strategy we can do to help increase the variety is to deconstruct mixed foods to a single texture. Um, from an oral motor standpoint, um, um, mixed textures are harder to manage. So you think about something like soup or chili, you're managing a, a, a solid, which is the beans or the vegetables and the meat and the liquid at the same time. So that's challenging from an oral motor standpoint. It's also challenging from a sensory standpoint. Um, and so if, you, if, you're, if you've noticed that most of your kids' preferred foods are the single textures, try deconstructing that. For example, drain the chili, drain the liquid off the chili or the soup, where it's just that one single texture of the meats, the solids, the uh, beans, tomatoes, and um, et cetera. Um, and one thing that's also a really important step is to only modify one aspect of the preferred food at a time. And, and that would be uh, the modify the texture, the flavor, or the visual presentation. Back to our previous, our slide of um, the, the peanut butter sandwich on the Thomas train plate, we would wanna go in and do crunchy peanut butter and strawberry jelly and on a different plate because you're modifying all three of those things. So instead you could do one thing at a time so that it can um, set your child up for success. We don't wanna overwhelm them um, with too many changes. And again, um, mealtime strategies, mealtime expectations, um, it takes, it, those are established over years of experience and uh, the, the experiences your child has had during mealtime. So change is gonna be really slow. We want to, to make really small steps and we want to praise those steps um, so that so that we can your uh, so that when we're changing your child's making the effort to accept new mealtime strategies to accept new presentations new flavors and they're going to be rewarded with that success so again modifying only one aspect of the preferred food at a time will help uh, make your child a little a more successful during mealtime so this last slide is um, just kind of a, 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 um, a summary of um, kind of the roles during mealtime, division of responsibility. So you can see what the parents are responsible for is what foods they serve to their children, when they serve it, and then where the eating occurs. And we've talked about strategies to support all those. And you can see what the child is responsible for, how much of that food they're eating and whether they eat any of it at all. You know, as a parent, we, you know, we, we need to try, try and try again, continue to, to do those exposures, continue to model those positive mealtime um, interactions and continue to, um, from a sensory standpoint, encourage your child to interact with new foods. Um, This is our contact information here at Anna Shaw. If you feel as though your child may benefit for individualized support through feeding therapy, um, this is our contact information. In our setting, our speech therapist addresses the mechanical and motor part of feeding and the OT helps support more the sensory behavioral aspects of feeding. Um, and so give us a call and we can talk about what our referral process is and um, um, get you connected if you need some more individualized support for feeding therapy. Thank you so much.